It's a time in our service where we collect an offering. To those attending MCC Boston through our social media, you too can participate by going to our website at mccboston.org and clicking on the donate button there for that purpose. Thank you for being a part of our church family. Members and friends of MCC Boston, as many of us know, MCC Boston kicked off our 2023-2024 stewardship drive last week. The theme of this year's drive is doing my part, and it's a reminder that each and every one of us has a part to play in the ongoing success and forward momentum of our church, its ministries, ministries which connect us to our creator, to one another, and to the community beyond our doors. Last week, we asked you, our church family, to take home a pledge card and pray over it, um, what resources that you can commit to MCC Boston over the next year. If you completed your pledge card and you're ready to submit it, you can add it to the complexion plate this evening. As a way of demonstrating our progress, each week we'll be updating our rainbow graphic and coloring in the area up to the amount presently pledged. As you can see from the graphic, we are just starting with a clean slate. As is our custom here at MCC Boston, we'll be highlighting the colors of the rainbow each week with a story that emphasizes aspects of stewardship. This evening, our first color is purple. Purple is actually an overlay of two colors, blue and red. Colors often associated with dawn and dusk and with new beginnings and beautiful endings. For some of us, many who may be viewing this evening's service virtually, MCC Boston may be a new beginning. For these folks, being a good steward of MCC Boston means sticking out your elbows and scooching on up to the table and making yourself a place there. Your energy and new ideas will keep MCC Boston relevant and vibrant. To those of us who've been members of the MCC Boston family for some time, being a good steward sometimes means bringing about beautiful endings. In other words, moving on to other needed ministry opportunities while making a place for others to add their creativity and energy. It also means being encouraging and open to new possibilities. Thank you to all who have completed your pledge card for this evening. Know that you are a blessing to this faith community. If you haven't already, please play, take a pledge card home and then pray over it and give careful consideration to your level of support to MCC Boston. You'll find a pledge card conveniently located in your bulletin this evening. Our pledge drive is continuing for a few more weeks, so there's still time for you to make your pledge. And remember, no pledge amount is too small for it could be your pledge that enables MCC Boston to meet its goals. So this week, pray for the success of our stewardship drive and are for continued success in spreading the life-affirming messages of MCC. For now, as the basket is presented, please give as you are able, and may God continue to bless you and MCC Boston. Thank you. Our scripture reading this evening is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. All right. Hi. 
So today's reading is the first in a section in Matthew known as the controversy passages, which is to say that this is the part of the story where the Pharisees really, really want to get rid of Jesus, but they have to find a compelling reason so that the common folk don't turn on them. They know that they can't stop Jesus without justification, so they start looking at things completely unrelated to what they're actually upset about, but they think that will convince the general public to side against Jesus. In this first attempt, they've decided to go the Al Capone route and try to nail Jesus for tax evasion, which was a touchy subject in the context. Keep in mind that these taxes are not like our taxes, which are themselves problematic in many ways, but these are taxes paid to Rome, an occupying force. These taxes are a protection racket. The Romans came in and violently conquered this part of the world, and continuing to use the threat of violence, they've made it known that anyone who refuses to pay taxes will be subject to more violence. So as you can imagine, taxes were not particularly popular with the general public, if they ever have been. And yet, to vocally oppose taxes, especially to encourage others to refuse them, risked provoking the ire of the Roman Empire, who might not only kill you, but decide to put down a whole bunch of your followers and anyone else who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Pharisees and Herodians were well aware of this and knew that they were asking Jesus a yes or no question, to which yes and no were both deadly answers. This was actually an ironic partnership. The Herodians were in favor of the taxation system, pledging their allegiance to Herod Antipas, who was appointed by Rome. The Pharisees were opposed to Roman taxes, not because of the hardship they presented the community necessarily, but more because the coins used to pay taxes were a graven image proclaiming the divinity of the Roman emperor, which renders them blasphemous. So not only was Jesus asked an impossible question, but he was asked this question by two different groups, one of which would be incensed to hear a yes, and the other of which would be incensed to hear a no. But Jesus is a smart man and can see from a mile away that a trap is being set for him. He even calls them out for their hypocrisy, and knowing that both answers are wrong, Jesus gives a completely different answer. First pointing out that the image on the coin is that of Caesar and not of God, and then using that for his answer, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, meaning the coin, and give to God what is God's. In this way, he avoids the wrath of Rome by not encouraging the crowd to refuse to pay taxes, while also dodging any claims of blasphemy, because he clearly pointed out that the coin is not of God. The coin was made by empire and belongs to empire, and so giving it back to empire is in no way blasphemy. The trouble is that Jesus' answer, though brilliantly derived, only opens up two more questions that we have to answer to fully understand it. The first is, what is Caesar's? And the second is, what is God's? Now, the central question between these two is, how does a person of faith living under the rulership of the state appropriately divide their loyalties? And as with all important theological questions, there are many different answers to be found across Christian history and theology. One way of answering this question is to say that our loyalties are divided based on the requirements of each. That is to say, there are some things that we owe God, and some things we owe the state, and we should give to each what we owe them. We don't pray to the state. We don't pay taxes to God. We don't take communion to be part of the state, and we don't vote for God. We don't fast for the state, and we don't have to do jury duty for church. There is a clear division, and there are responsibilities to be observed on both ends. There is something alluring about this logic. There's a clean separation. It sounds fair and even-handed, and there's a simplicity to it. It allows us an easy way to divide two loyalties. Some actions pay tribute to one. Some actions pay tribute to the other, and it depends on what the action is. Here's my sticking point with it. By making this claim, by deciding that we have different loyalties to each, we are placing the state at the level of God. We are saying that both rule over us in different ways and in different areas of our lives. 
but each is supposedly right to rule over us. And that may seem right to some, but I just can't get there. Because I believe that God rules over every part of my life. Because I believe that I and we owe everything to God. And that God is one and no other rules beside her. As far as I see it, neatly dividing our responsibilities in this way is the same as setting another ruler next to God. And I will abide no other ruler. My obedience belongs to God and to God only. The next way of thinking about this is to say that the obedience to God requires obedience to the state. That essentially, to be a loyal member of the government is to be loyal to God. In discussing this school of thought, we would also be remiss to omit discussion of Paul's writings in Romans 13, that all must be subject to ruling authorities, that these authorities are appointed by God, that ruling authorities target evildoers and not those that do good, So to do good in the name of God will also satisfy the state. In a similar statement to Jesus's, Paul writes, pay to all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. I feel like it's come up once or twice before in this church that I am an anarchist, so you can already guess that I'm not a big fan of this approach. I think Paul's writings were probably good advice to the people of Rome, his intended audience, in his own era, his intended context. The problem is that certain parts of Paul's logic are observably false from our experience. For one thing, we can all plainly see that the government does not only persecute evildoers and acquit those who do good. We have eyes, after all. We know that governments have done evil things to innocent people, to the indigenous people of this land and of many lands, to innocent civilians of marginalized identities, and even to people who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. We can also plainly see that the government freely acquits evildoers when it serves them, that it condones rampant bribery and actions which bring suffering to the general public so long as those actions are being perpetrated by a certain class of people. Moreover, there are people who would love to tell you that they believe obedience to the state is obedience to God, but I think you would find in each case that it also depends heavily on which government you're talking about. Often these people mean their own government. But if you pointed to Cuba, if you pointed to China, if you pointed to the US, the UK, the EU, the Soviet Union, or to Russia today, If you pointed to Israel, to Syria, to South Africa, to Chile, to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you would get a different answer. Lots of people love to parade this verse around to encourage obedience to their own government, but you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone in the world, Christian or not, who believes that every government is appointed by God and it is always right to obey them. And even then, The same people who tell you on Sunday that it's right to honor the U.S. government will tell you the next Sunday that Joe Biden is the Antichrist. But beyond that even, this outlook essentially advocates Christian nationalism. It makes the state a part of God. If disobeying the state is disobeying God, if honoring the state is honoring God, then the state becomes an extension of God itself. It mixes God and government, church and state, And as a popular saying holds, the problem with a theocratic state is when I mix ice cream and cow dung together, the ice cream doesn't make the cow dung any cleaner. Now, another way of answering this is to say that our first obedience is to God, but that we owe the state a sort of lesser obedience. There's a two-tiered system. The state is a Delta Rewards member, but God is Delta Platinum Diamond Plus Rewards member, so she gets even more of our obedience. So sure, we pay our taxes, we vote, we serve on the jury, and those things are right and important. But more important and more right is to go to church, to pray, to practice one's faith through acts of obedience to God. And there is appeal to this logic as well. It solves the issue of parity between God and state. It firmly states that God comes first, as she must, but it still allows for us to observe the requirement of the state in all the ways it demands, except that it doesn't quite. 
because we know that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And we know that God and the state are distinct entities with distinct interests. And it's inevitable that those interests will come into conflict. God wants us to serve the poor, but the ruling authorities say that this only encourages the poor to become more dependent on us and our tax dollars. God wants us to seek peace, but the government profits from war. God wants us to delight in the truth, but the state has its own truths and wants it to abide by those. Moreover, we know that there are times when our government gets it wrong. We know that our government, even our own, has advocated slavery, has enacted genocide, has brought violence down on its own people, and on other people who are just as much God's children as we are. It's all well and good to try to give the state a sort of lesser obedience, but I think you'll find that the state, as any ruling power, is not content with a lesser obedience if the greater obedience is in conflict, and conflict is inevitable. So now that I've weaved this whole tangled web of religious and governmental philosophy, we can see the trick in all of this. When we pledge allegiance to two great powers, they are bound to come into conflict, and we will not know where that conflict will lead us. But here's what I really think about this whole conversation. What if the point is not that it's right and good to pay taxes? What if the point is that taxes are no concern of ours, and neither is any financial transaction? What if we're meant to recognize that that little coin with Caesar's face on it, and some high words praising his being, what if we're just not meant to care about that coin at all? To recognize that the coin itself is one of the trappings of empire, so we don't care about giving it back to them. After all, what can that coin buy us anyway but prestige in a society that is passing away? A society we don't really care about being part of in the first place. Jesus does tell us elsewhere to be in the world but not of the world. So what if the whole point of this conversation is to say that yes, we are forced to live in places with governments because they have seized every inch of this planet and we should not needlessly grapple with them but we should recognize that the thing that the state lusts after are no concern of ours. It's a coin from the government and the government can have it because it's not really that important. Maybe we allow the state to do its statey things, but we keep our minds and hearts focused on God. Maybe by saying, why do you test me? Jesus is also saying, why do you waste my time? with the trivialities of this shallow earthly kingdom when I am about the work of God's kingdom in the world, which will one day eclipse all the petty concerns of your government just as surely as that coin will one day dissolve into dust. Maybe the point is that none of what is Caesar's is any concern of ours, so who cares if we give it back to him? We focus on our own work. We focus on our God and the community that she is building. We focus on bringing good news to this world that something better is coming, something that will not need to conquer us through brute force and violence because it pulls us in with its love. And I think it's no coincidence that Jesus asks first whose picture is on that coin because another way of phrasing that is whose image does that coin bear? And the coin bears Caesar's image, so it belongs to Caesar. And what bears God's image? We do. We belong to God, wholly, inseparably, no matter how much any ruling power may claim authority over us or over others. And so we focus not on keeping to ourselves a bunch of meaningless coins with the face of a man we'll never meet. We focus on giving ourselves to God. We focus on bringing God's people back to her. We focus on showing them the love that will draw them to God. And that will, at times, place us in conflict with the governments who have no regard for people who bear God's image. We will, at times, have to say that the state is wrong, that the state brings harm and death to those who belong to God, that the state even now is bringing violence upon God's people in order to make sure that Caesar's coin stays in the right pockets, that it is wrong to stand aside silently while the state murders God's own image thousands of miles away to other people whom we'll also never meet. And yes, this sentence is about Palestine, but it's also lamentably about way too many other places as well. 
Mm. Jesus did not fail to speak the truth to the state. It's what they killed him for. But Jesus also does not recognize the power of the state as anything he needs to contend with. He does not care for the little coin because the coin has only the power the government gives it. And the government cannot bestow power upon anything. So that little coin is worth no more than any other piece of metal in comparison to the power of God who places that power where it's meant to be with the people, who places her care and protectiveness over the lives and health of her people instead of sacrificing the people in order to hoard little coins with a face on them. Thank you.